are bright and shiny in my mind You got me loving, hating, crazy indecision in my mind Welcome to the Fall Podcast, where the focus is on deer hunting, tips, tricks, tactics, and stories from across the Midwest. And now, here is your host, Aaron Blisey. Welcome to the Fall Podcast. I am your host, Aaron Blisey, and this is episode number 48. And we have a returning guest this week. It's Greg Litzinger. And Justin didn't get to be on the last one we did because I was just doing everything on my own this time. So, buddy, I'm super excited to have you on this call because Greg is a super awesome guy and knows his stuff when it comes to hunting in general, but public land hunting also. Yeah, I'm excited to to have the conversation with him because from what you said, you know, after I came on board, and, and obviously having listened to him the first time around when he was on, it just really struck me as somebody who, I don't want to say is stuck in a place where people don't typically deer hunt, but he's not stuck there. He lives there. It's just, that's where his life is. But it is a state that people right. typically don't deer hunt, and that's New Jersey. But the people that do deer hunt there, like, if, if you've ever had a conversation or have the opportunity to talk to somebody who, who hunts New Jersey, they're going to tell you, like, it's, they probably wouldn't trade it. You know they're gonna they're gonna take a Midwest hunt any chance they get, but I would bet you nine out of ten people are perfectly happy hunting in New Jersey, and the fact that there's public land there is just a, a double bonus. Like in my mind, that's that's awesome. Yeah, and he's been hunting public land for like thirty years, yeah. and he's killed some really good deer out there. And like like you alluded to there, I mean he's kind of got his back against the wall. I mean they can kill like five bucks out there, and that's just unbelievable (laughs) you know like here in michigan we can kill two and i think it's too many (laughs) you know i wish it was one buck so that's just crazy how they can kill five bucks out there and he's still killing the deer that he's killing on public land and it's it's pretty crazy this you know this is more of a kind of a bs session but we get into a lot of cool topics and you know we talk about scouting this time of year which we're in march right now and we talk about you know the mentality that you should have hunting on public land, which I think is huge because like we've been talking the last couple of weeks, I want to hunt some public land this year. You know, I don't know if my patience, if I can do it in my sure. mentality. So I really got to adapt and just kind of be a positive, you know, have a positive manner towards the whole thing. Yeah. Like you said, just be positive. It's, it's a, it's a different light, you know, it's, it's looking at deer hunting in a different light. And I will tell you, like having come from New York, um, I, I did live upstate. I know for a fact there are a substantial number. I don't know the exact number, but there's a substantial number of Boone and Crockett, I'm sorry, Pope and Young record entries that come out of New York State, and 90% of them are from Long Island. Really? Yeah, and it's. I know guys that have killed 170s to 180s in the suburbs of Long Island. You know, if you think about places like Illinois where... You know, you typically see people hunting these, these these narrow fingers, you know, between bedding and food or, you know, just a small strip of timber or a small chunk, like a quarter acre, you know, block. It's exactly how Long Island is, or in this case, New Jersey. Like, there are some mountains in New Jersey, believe it or not. But you get into these urban areas, it's it's archery only. You're the minority as a hunter. Like, there are more people that don't hunt than that do hunt. So if you can find a place to get out there and put your time in, I think you have probably one of the best chances of shooting a high caliber buck anywhere in the country in places like that. And it's just a cool dynamic. Right. It's just a different way to look at it. It's like I said, so overlooked and it's, a, it's kind of sheds a different light on deer hunting. Yeah, it really, it really does. And it really, you really got to have good woodsmanship and really know what the heck you're doing out there to be successful. And not only Greg, but I mean, there's a lot of guys out there doing it, but he's just one of, of many and a lot of them that you don't hear about. You know, Greg's a guy that you don't really hear a lot about unless you're in the inner circle, I guess, if you will, of those kind of guys. And I've just been fortunate enough to stumble upon him and, and uh, get to know him a little bit. And he's he's just a really cool guy. So yeah. I don't know. I mean, with that, let's let's get after this interview and let's switch it over there and, and uh, let's let Greg take it from there. Yeah, sounds good. But before we get to that, if you guys are in the market for new strings and cables this year, go to AmericasBestBowStrings.com, 
Customize your new strings and cables, and at checkout, type in Fall Podcast to get $10 off orders $99 and over. So all you got to do is go to americasbestbowstrings.com, like I said, and at checkout, type in Fall Podcast to get $10 off any sets of custom strings that you want from America's Best. All right, we are back, and today we have a returning guest with Justin and I today, and it's Greg Litzinger from New Jersey. Greg, what's going on, man? Having me, guys. Oh, Not nothing. too much. It's uh, it's chilly here still in Michigan, and I'm getting sick of it. <laughs> I say it every <laughs> week. I'm, I'm sick of this cold, man. Yeah, and pretty soon it'll be hot, and we're like, man, I can't wait for the cold. <laughs> yeah, the fall. Bring on the fall for me. I can't complain too much. I mean, even though there is a lot of snow, I, I don't mind the cold. It's it's all the snow that's on the ground. You just can't d- go out and do anything, it seems like. so. Yeah. I, would, we never, I never have to worry about it here in New Jersey. It snows. And next day it's 56 degrees and it's all gone. Yeah. <laughs> that's, pretty much, that's pretty much how it goes here in South Jersey. Yep. Justin, you probably still got snow out there, don't you, in Iowa? Yeah, my neighbors aren't probably very happy with me because I was out there at 5.30 this morning shoveling snow to open the gate to my my backyard. And uh, <laughs> I went ripping through there with my four-wheeler trying to get some stuff out of the basement to get set up for the Deer Classic today. and. Yeah, how's that? Uh, how's that, is that busy? That Deer Classic? Uh, it was just vendors today setting up their booths, but I mean, we got in with our stuff today at like oh, I don't know, nine o'clock, and we just we drove right in, and there was plenty of people to help us set up and put things together, and we left at noon, and there was a line around the block of people waiting to get in. <laughs> really? Yeah, it was it was something. Yeah, you got a long weekend ahead of you, long three days. Yeah. <laughs> that's true and i just spent the last two days building the walls for that booth and i regret to admit that i'm actually sore from that so now i gotta go stand there for the next two days and <laughs> be on my feet for for two well two and a half more solid days anyway but yeah you need to go right. do some push-ups or sit-ups or something and get rid of the yeah. old man sore <laughs> oh, man i'm i got back into the gym i'm you know I kind of lost that soggy biscuit feeling after you get after deer season. <laughs> soggy <laughs> but, uh, biscuit. Oh, yeah. Wow. Well, Greg, what's oh, going yeah. on, man? How was uh, how was your season? I see it was successful. You and I kind of talked in the fall a little bit about your buck, but not didn't get into too much detail. But uh, how did it end up for you? It was good, you know. Finally, uh, finally tagged, put a tag on a buck after those three, almost three. I shot that deer like so pretty much three years and three days since I shot a, a buck, you know, not from a lack of trying or opportunity. It's just, right. you know, when you're, you know, seeing a deer and killing is completely different. You know, that's a whole different story. Yep. Um, yeah. But the season started out just on a fantastic note as far as like buck sighting. Um, like here in New Jersey, you have to shoot a doe if you shoot a buck. Yep. And, um, they had one of the biggest deer I've seen in this area, biggest I've ever seen in this particular swamp. I mean, come in at 15 yards, eight with a seven pointer, like a beautiful seven pointer. To, uh, you know, first week of the season. I'm like, I don't believe this. I've been hunting here like 10 years or something. I've never <laughs> seen a buck outside of the rut. And I'm like, oh. it comes in there just eating, no care in the world. He's 15 yards. And I'm like, just go away, please. Just go away. And he would like come back and leave and come back. And that he did that for about an hour. And it was just like brutal. It was like ripping my heart out, but I was happy at the same time. So I'm like, wow, I've never seen a deer that big early in the season before. So I'm like, man, this is going to be insane. And of course, yeah, everything just went downhill after that <laughs> until, uh, you know, until I shot, uh, shot my buck, uh, late October. But I was, um, up in the mountains. Seems to be my my place uh, yeah. for shooting bucks. I guess seems to be my <laughs> I'm away from home. Exactly. <laughs> you you do a lot of scouting out there. You know, you look at your social media and everything, and you're out there all the time on your canoe, walking around, talking about persimmon yeah. trees. <laughs> yeah, and so, uh, yeah, this, this particular buck was. I mean, that was up for yeah, me and my lifelong you know hunting buddy, and when we started hunting together when we were 15. 
And we always try to make a trip up to the mountains at least once, either winter bow or fall bow. And uh, last year, we didn't go because we went to Montana, yeah. So this year we went, and I went up for like two days. The wind was just like 40 miles an hour. It was just awful. You know, trying to sit in a tree stand, you know, getting blown or what, you know. So I got down, thought I was going to just like – loop around this uh, ridge, see if I could just find some sign, because there was just no deer sign at all, like walking these ridges. I just kept seeing all this bear sign. So I'm like, man, there's a bear here. There's sure something's going to be any deer here. So I ended up like dipping down this ridge, and I found this old double X-75 with a thunderhead, an arrow, you know, broken off aluminum arrow, like just sitting on this rock, all sun faded, bleached out. And I just picked it up and I looked at it. I was like, man, this is such a cool, just the, the story behind the arrow. I also went in like a little daze. Right. And uh, I guess I was sort of like walking, you know, and I had an arrow. I was like, I was, I was still hunting, but at this point I'm just walking. I'm like, oh. and I ended up going down this ridge further than I wanted. My, uh, my, my phone was going off in my pocket. So it was my buddy Rick on his way up. And we're just talking. You know, I'm just kind of like this inching down this ridge because the wind's blowing like 30 miles an hour. Wind, you know, leaves, noise. And uh, I'm sitting, <laughs> sitting, I guess I'm like in this dark shadow. I didn't realize at the time, but I'm on, on the phone just as we're talking. I look up and there's an eight-pointer looking right at me. I'm like, huh. I was like, frick. <laughs> I was like, I have an eight-pointer standing right at me. And he's like, shoot it. I'm like, no, it's like literally staring right at me. I'm going to go, 20 yards away from this deer, maybe. <laughs> I'm like, stupid. it's like standing right at me. He goes, shoot it. I'm like, yeah. And I was like, so I just put the phone, I slid the phone down in my pocket, put the arrow back on the string. The deer's looking at me the whole time. And I'm like, he doesn't even know what's going on. And wow. I thought, yeah, I thought he was like love struck. He's like, he was cruising for bucks or uh, cruising for does. Yep. So I'm like, he's going to bust any second now. And he so it's like, he gets a little spooky and cagey and he's going off and I'm like, I get the arrow and I'm like facing on one, like downhill. He starts going up. But I'm like ranging real fast and I didn't even pull, pull, uh, put my range finder on him. Thank goodness I shoot 3D because I was like, all right, that's 20. He's going to be like, that's like 32. And, you know, it just happened so fast. And I remember like pulling back and I was like shooting like cross body and I got my stand sticks and my backpack on him. I got 50 pounds on my back. So I'm trying to shoot all the way cross by to my right. Like I'm a righty, so I'm trying to lean right. My hips are facing like left. And I'm getting a pin on the deer and it's bouncing off and it's bouncing on. I'm like, just stay. Because <laughs> my body's like so twisted up. I'm like, just relax. And uh, I'm looking, I was like, I'm just, the pin's right where it needs to be, but I just keep bouncing off the deer. And I, I, I don't even know. It's just kind of, everything just happened so fast. I was so like, <laughs> tent and went up and I had this uh, piece of blue tape on my riser. It says breathe because I had to get in the habit sometimes not breathing through my shot. And I kind of like, I'm on the pin, you know, on the deer, the pin's bouncing all over the place. I just kind of look up, I see the blue out of like my peripheral and it was like, like subconsciously like the shot went off and I end up just like making a, a perfect shot on the deer. Wow. Like, as it happened, shot goes through on my pull my phone out. I was like, I shot him, and Ricky's like, what? Wait, you shot him? I'm like, dude, I shot him. I just shot <laughs> he was him. still on the phone? <laughs> He's still on the phone. Oh, I, thought cool. I, I, thought I, heard you, I thought I heard a shot, you know, and I'm like, yeah, I shot him. He goes, I was shot. I was like, I think pretty good. He was kind of poured away, centered, like everything looked good. I was like, but I don't really know yet, you know, because I'm just going to sit here. And also, so jacked up because I've had that happen so many times, kicking you know, seeing deer like that and never get the shot because you ever think it, you can't get the shot off. Right. And, uh, so we're talking on the phone and I mean, had to be five minutes. I walk over and this deer was actually bedded right there. I kicked this deer up out of his bed as I was working my way down this ridge. He was bedded there, you know, with the wind, you know, and I guess he really couldn't smell me because the way the wind was going and then thermals and everything. But either he heard me or like seen something. But where I was like situated, the big like uh, just real dark part of the big old couple oak trees, 
it might even have been a big maple there, just a massive maple. And I was just in that little bit of like bit of shadow in the darkness. So he had no idea I was there, I guess. And but I think he was like trotting off. He didn't just want to run because he didn't know where to go, I think. So he was like, Well, I'm still gonna be cautious and like a typical buck will just stay motionless. So what the whole time like him and I are eye to eye and I'm talking on the phone, this deer couldn't see me probably, you know, just the way oh, all the I chaos see. in the back with the leaves yep. and everything. I got you. It was like that perfect scenario storm and for once it actually <laughs> that's crazy like you you know you put all this time and effort in and you're hunting your ass off and you know doing all these hanging hunts and everything and traveling up to the mountains to get to get in there and then you're just talking on the phone one day and he walks straight up on you (laughs) yep and uh and like it was just so uh like it happened like so fast and like the beauty of this was like i you know always wanted to you know bump a deer on a bed and shoot it with a with any weapon you know, be the, I tried with guns for years. It never worked, and I haven't gun hunted in years. So you always see them. They're always, like, running 100 miles an hour. You jump them up out of a bed. But I've come to the conclusion, windy days are good for that. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and try to stay in a shadow of something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it's, um, and the, the, the funny, you know, another cool part of the story is, like, I actually did an Instagram live, like, after I shot it here. And all these people are like, did you hit him? I was like, I hit him, but I don't know where. As I'm, I'm, I'm laying off, like just looking for my arrow and looking for blood. I'm like, all right, the deer's right here. I can see his tracks. I'm like, man, did I miss him? You know, and I'm like, and all of a sudden I see like a drop of blood. I'm like, all right, I got some blood. And the whole thing was like on Instagram live thing. And then you see my arrow and just that, like, because I'm looking at myself, you know, like, and I can like, on my phone, and like you see the like the arrows just covering blood. Blood was just everywhere, and that deer literally made it like sixty yards. Like he couldn't ask for a, a better shot than that deer. And he, the best part, he literally ran. I mean, I was only three hundred yards away from the truck. He literally ran right to the truck. So I literally had a hundred yard drag. I've never shot a deer in the mountain. Getting <laughs> that close to the truck, I was like, wow, this is awesome i mean this can't get any better <laughs> i mean you literally had it fall in your lap everything <laughs> yeah yeah after you know almost 30 years i actually have one of those hunts that some people seem to have all the time i actually had one you had one and it was it was um, oh. it was such a great weekend because um no you know that there and then the next night i ended up shooting a doe on state uh, we drove around, found this piece of stay, and I never stepped foot in. I ended up shooting a doe that night, you know, a perfect shot. And my buddy was hunting on the ground, and he ended up seeing this big eight pointer. And um, so I was like, I'm not hunting anymore. I got two deer as it is. So he went out and sat on the ground all day. He 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 slept until like nine. You know, and we're talking October 25th, yep. 24th or something. So it's not really rut, but he sat on the ground in the mountains and literally he shot an absolute mountain toad the last, you know, five minutes of light. Wow. And I made a perfect shot on it. Yeah. I mean, he hasn't shot a buck in 10 years. And the kicker to the story is the last buck he shot was literally from the same section of woods 10 years ago. And he shot an absolute hammer 10 years prior. And the same, I mean, Hundred yards away from where he shot that one. So a decade later, he shoots his biggest deer to date. Mm-hmm. So we shoot that. You know, I shoot my buck in the doe, and he has this absolute you know beast of a deer. So we're literally driving home with three deer in the back of the truck. That's awesome. That's you know, crazy. Like, uh, that's really awesome. Yeah, it's like you couldn't ask. Like you, that will never happen again. You know, um, I, I was more happy for Rick actually shooting his deer because. You know, he's didn't necessarily get out of hunting, but life gets in the way and, you know, wife, kids and, you know, being a contractor, you know, work right. comes first. And for him to, you know, shoot a deer, you know, in the same spot, we literally shot one 10 years prior, I mean, to the day. Like, it was like, holy crap, it's just insane. And Rick, <laughs> he won a bow last year at the Total Archer Challenge, like a prime, with a raffle. Yep. So not only did he win a bow last year, he shot that deer with that bow he won. So it was like this whole weird, you know, 
just a crazy three days. I hope you guys went and bought lotto tickets right when you were heading (laughs) home. We should (laughs) have. Seriously. Yeah, it was uh, absolutely insane and had the the worst weather you could possibly have. You know, it was like windy, like everything that you don't think you'd have success on. Like we, you know, had success on, you know, still hunting, you know, ground hunting and tree stand hunting all in a matter of like three days and like three different pieces of property. Yeah, that's crazy. I'll remember that forever. I'll tell you that much. That's just one of those things, like, just gnarly. That's a trip you'll never forget, for sure. Yeah. You know, you were briefly talking there how you, like in New Jersey, you have to kill a doe before you kill a buck. I'm glad you kind of brought that up. I've been wanting to know, you know, Wisconsin didn't earn a buck for a long time, if you want to call it earn a buck, but you had to shoot a, a doe before a buck. Do you think that's beneficial you know, to have that law like that? Do you like it? No, I think it's the fact that we have, like, like I mean, uh, I hate sounding like I'm complaining or whining, but I know of a half dozen people who just call deer in opening morning to get a doe tag, and they have either, either one of their buddies will shoot a doe, and nine times out of ten, it's a it's a yearling, butt and buck or a yearling. Yeah. You know, they damn near out of spot. And they literally would use that deer. Like, everybody will, will call and check that deer in. There's a group. I mean, I personally know groups of guys that do that, like teams, you know, whatever. You know, the cool thing to be as a, on, the, on a hunting team, I guess. I don't know. Um, but literally, they will use that same deer for everybody. And it's like, you know, for me, I mean, that's just not me. I, I don't know. I, I don't say I was born, you know, raised differently or raised with better morals. But for me... I don't see the benefit of having earn a buck. Like I understand the, the, I guess the, the management standpoint from it, but at the same time, I, I, I struggle with it because I don't see how it makes that much of an impact. Yeah. Because you, I think the earn a buck is for them to, you're trying to take some does out of the herd, but we pretty much, some of the zones I hunt have unlimited doe tags. So technically you can shoot, you know, five, six, seven, eight does. So having yeah. an earn a buck in a place that has, you can shoot you know, a crap load of does, to me, the, the number of things doesn't add up. Yeah, that's, I agree with you because this is my first year hunting in Iowa and you can buy five doe tags per day here <laughs> in any county. Like as long as the quota is not met, you can buy up to five a day and you don't even have to shoot a buck. I that's mean, so, crazy. I so didn't if, even know if, that, I guess. If if the answer New Jersey has, you know, for the doe problem or the, you know, the assumed doe problem they have is to shoot a doe to earn your buck is... Well, I, I look at it because I've had to pass up bucks, you know. Like, I don't shoot a lot of those to get one. I'll shoot enough to keep my freezer full. Um, you know, try to shoot one or two a year. You know, do my part. Or one or two is on the fall, like one winter bow. But, I mean, I've passed up on numerous bucks... You know, because I couldn't shoot though, because uh, it's just one of those things where it's like, well, look, here comes the buck, well, no doe tag. So if you're looking yeah. to, to, get, to drop deer numbers, like I could shoot a, 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 a you know a buck opening morning. There's a deer that's out of population. Plus, he's not going to breed. You know, there's, there's less deer on the grand scheme of things. Yeah, you want to you want to reduce deer numbers statewide. You need to make the season longer. Start it sooner and close it later give people the option or the opportunity to shoot more. Yeah. Well, ours in Jersey, I mean, our season starts the second week of September and goes to end of January. Like it's a long season. That is I a mean, long we're populated season. State. Yeah. yeah it's a, we're a populated state, but in Jersey, you can kill six bucks, five or six bucks. Wow. Yeah. And that, that's a, that's a whole nother issue that I, I scratch my head about. Why is that? Like, why, why is it so many bucks you can kill? I mean, I, I, Honestly, I'd like to see Michigan possibly go to a one buck state. To be honest with you, yeah. and we can kill two. Yeah, I can kill. You need to kill two. Like it's fine. Like in, in Jersey, you can kill one early season with a bow, you can kill one permit, one with a muzzle loader, two during six day firearm, and then one buck at winter bow. It just jacks your age structure up. I mean, some some places have the antler restrictions, which I think is beneficial. Three on one side, it gives the, right. the bucks a chance. But some of those zones I hunt, it's 
anything to go to spikes, four pointers, you know, and we got a lot of, a lot of clubs still in Jersey. They do a lot of drives, a lot of pushing. So our age structure in, in some piece of the public is like poop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, and I get guys that don't bow hunt. They gun hunt and they only kill two bucks. Okay. I mean, I, I it's a, it's a meat thing. Like I get it. Um, but if you, if, if New Jersey would run like their dough days during like maybe firearm week, you know, I don't know, maybe you could probably save some of them spikes, four pointers, you know, um, yeah. people are just killing for meat. You know, if you kill a hundred pound spike or a hundred pound dough, you have the same amount of meat, you know, but right. I don't know. Most people probably shoot the buck just for bragging rights. But they said they teach her and like, I try not to get too, uh, We'll work up about it because I I personally don't do my part. I don't talk to biologists on, on a regular basis or, or go to these meetings that they have with the conservation officers, biologists, and the hunters. I try not to get too worked up because I really don't do enough or, or have enough knowledge to really speak on it. Mm-hmm. This is just uh, like you know, thoughts that I would have, you know, uh, from a logic standpoint. Like I said, I. I don't know actual harvest data numbers and all the other stuff. Yeah, I was just curious. I mean, that's a that's a lot of bucks that you can kill. And I think, mm-hmm. you know, like I said, I'd like to, you know, Michigan here, move it to one buck. Uh, I think that'd be a step in the right direction for a lot of hunters' complaints. But that's for another conversation, too. But So you, you know, last time you and I talked, you were talking about how you are a terrible rut hunter. That <laughs> You don't, like... The- you you, just, you don't kill bucks in the rut. <laughs> you kill all years in October, yeah. which you get did again this year. But uh, yeah. I was curious how your rut went this year. Uh, this is actually I made progress, a step in the right direction. I always save my vacation for November because I'm like, sooner one of these years it's going to happen. And uh, it's been almost ten years I think since I killed a buck in November. Um, and this year I came the closest I've been in a long time to. Numerous bucks. I mean, I've had, I don't know, four or five world-class deer for New Jersey. And I actually got within 15 yards of a a possible booner and a freak snowstorm that we had one day. Rainy, sleety, windy snowstorm. Um, Still hunting these little ridges. And I was walking out and I could see uh, a deer's back covered in snow. So I just crept up behind this giant tree and like an idiot, I got right on the tree because I thought she was going to see me. You know, I realized it was a doe and I'm like, I'll get real close to the tree. So I'm not going to spook her. And I'm looking at her and she's covered in snow. And I'm like, and it's got to be a buck for her to be bedded in that spot. I'm like, there's a buck around here somewhere. I'm looking all around, looking all around. And I, I mean, this tree is so big. I literally, the bow stayed on one side of the tree and I had to like creep and like lean way over. And as I looked at the other side of the tree, it was probably the biggest deer I've ever seen, like hunting wise, like actual, I can shoot, like not running by me a hundred miles an hour, sleeping 15 yards away. I mean, he had five points on one side, not including the brows. Uh, and he was, you know, good 12, 14, 15 inch times. Wow. I mean, the absolute deer of a lifetime. And, I about, you know, shit my pants when I seen him and I went to grab, like pull my bell up around the tree. Cause like I said, like an idiot, I got right against the tree. So I pretty much took any angle I had on this deer. And as I went to like, like look around the tree, the doe was up looking right at me. And you know, when, how that story ends, <laughs> she runs and he's dead sleep and he just takes off and they run across this mud flat. I mean, if you and I walked on it, we'd sink up to our waist. They literally ran across it like they were just like on a hoverboard. Right on across on the private. And I I think I, I might have cried a little bit. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I know the feeling. But yeah. Uh, that was 30 years. The uh, 20 minute was doing this. 28 years of hunting. For that moment right there, and I blew it. Because of, I don't even know why. Because I know better. You don't get ready against the tree because you got your angles off, you know? Right. Um, and it's like, 
Huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll probably never have an encounter like that with a deer in New Jersey. Did you ever hear about that deer ever getting killed or anything? No. Nope. Like I said, I've been hunting that area, that section, for about a decade. And there's been some good bucks, but never, I've never seen like a rub, something with like that long of times and like that wide, any type of destruction on a tree. So he was pretty much pulled in by her. I don't know where she came from, but I know, uh, they said I've never seen anything like it in New Jersey. (laughs) I probably never will. Is that the piece of public that you, is that your main piece of public or? You know, or is that another piece now, uh, that you're trying to hunt? That's the piece I hunt. Um, like, I've come to a collision, like, middle of November. Like, in the, in the, uh, that's when I have my, rut spot. Uh, my best. Yeah. Um, early season says a lot of those. I see some smaller bucks. So, you know, as I've gotten older these last couple of years, I've been really trying to dial on, like, rut hunting. So I'm like, all right, I got to be selective. I'm like, I hunt this and that one there, you're pretty much blown out where I hunt it, you know, where those deer were, you're pretty much blown out to hunt it. So you get like really one sit out of it because those does are, I mean, there's just so much heavy pressure, a lot of bait, you know, a lot of baiters and uh, gets hit hard with the gun hunters. So it's literally, it's a, it's a water two sits, you know, during the rut and, you know, move on. I gotcha. Yeah, that's, uh, that's crazy. I, you know, I've been, I've been, uh, I wouldn't say addicted, but I've been really got a hankering for, you know, scouting some public land and some local public land around here. I did it a couple well, last week or last weekend, something like that. And we're going to go again tomorrow and, and do some more, you know, walking around it. And, uh, I, I don't know, it just intrigues me so much to get out there and do it. And every time I set foot on, I think about guys like you that have been, you know, talking to me about about how to approach it and and Justin as well. I mean, you guys, everybody's kind of giving me a lot of pointers and what to do. So I'm excited. I, I like doing it, and uh, I can't wait to try to hunt it at least a little bit this year. It's, uh, speaking of like a like a long-term standpoint, like I've been doing it, you know, public ever since long before I started hunting because we used to, you know, go some of these pieces of public had lakes, so I'd fish them as a kid. So I was always in these pieces of woods and, and public, and it's such it's refreshing to see people get drawn into like uh, the public uh, aspect of hunting because it it gets really like it's a pure form of hunting almost because yeah. you're um, you're not only battling you know if you're you're battling a lot of a lot of elements and it can really force you to step your game up and and my whole idea of putting you know, myself on social media because I mean all I have is Instagram I don't on YouTube like I don't have Facebook or anything like that like it, I just want someone to look at what I'm doing and be like man if he's doing it I can do this you know like I want to inspire those people I get like messages or like talk to you guys that you know they think but I personally don't think I've done anything extreme or above and beyond to re- you know, warrant recognition, um, but I guess what I've done resonates with a lot of people and how I've done it, how, how I've gone about it. So when I get these messages, it's like it motivates me to you know keep you know trying new techniques because you know like the the bed hunting and, and the, the avenue like I've been doing that a long time, and now I'm trying to step my game up to be like a rut die like i, I want to kill deer in the rut so i can give people like my take or views or like my stories uh on that i think it would help me come around as a, a more complete hunter uh <laughs> i would just love to kill deer during the rut and share my experiences you know on videos or knowledge or or what not to do because i can tell you what not to do during november <laughs> i'm the king of that yeah, <laughs> yeah but i i get excited yeah, for sure, and that that's the, I mean, if you don't get excited, why are you doing it then, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it takes a, I would think it takes like a certain mentality to be able to hunt public land and patience and stuff like that, because you probably walk up on a lot of guys, or a lot of guys walk up on you, you know, and 
you know, you always feel like you're walking on eggshells when you're going into the woods and it's like, you want everything to be perfect. So it's like, you know, you got that scenario, crisp, nice, frosty morning, you get into the stand, nice and quiet, first light. And then all of a sudden you hear a twig snap and you look back and there's a guy walking underneath you. Like, how do you yeah. deal with that? Like, I know it's happened to you before, but how, I mean, how do you deal with stuff like that? When it does happen, um, yeah, I've gotten a lot better at controlling my emotions, like I've talked about this with uh, Aaron and Zach from uh, like the hunting public now. They, like deer, they don't get worked up when things get, get uh, are aligned that, you know, in the morning, like that buck's going to his bed and he cuts a track. He doesn't get all frazzled. He goes, oh, all right, like I can go here. Like they have, I guess, like, like I guess they keep a cool head. I've, try to take that same approach you know you don't really react to those things like you respond to them like reactions are very very negative you know can carry a very negative uh vibe to it so you see that you can't get frustrated you know that's the best thing it's it's woods it's public do your best take a deep breath and be like all right how can i make this work to my advantage or if he's going there you gotta like sit I always got my stand at six. So if I know he's going this way, I'm like that's where I planned on a deer coming from. So now maybe they're going to be wind bumping. So I'm like I'll 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 get down and go somewhere else. And a lot of times, those moments will actually put me on a better deer or a better opportunity because that you're using that guy to your advantage. But most people get you know sick. Uh, sick and leave the woods or whatever. I mean, a prime example, this year, I mean, this is a funny story, a great rut story. So we're hunting the salt marsh. It's a prime example of why you don't let people bother you. So me and my buddy are hunting the salt marsh. Uh, we go in by canoe and we're sitting in doe bedding areas. He's on one end, I'm on the other. And he calls me. There's people. I'm talking to these people right now. They're just walking around the woods getting ready for gun season. I'm like, all right, it's cool to stick around. Nah, man, F this. I'm leaving. I'm getting down. I'm like, well, it's my canoe, and we're staying. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I'm getting down. Yo, screw this. I'm going to be at the canoe. So he's just whining and complaining. So, of course, I just try to calm him down to stay. I'm telling you, it's going to pay off. doesn't want to stay, and he's just yeah, pissing a bitch. So I eventually... Yeah, I can hear him clanging the canoe like out in the water. I'm like, all right, let me just go. So I get down. As I get down, you know, I'm wrapping the, my stand and six up. I look up. Here comes a 10-pointer coming right at me that these guys bumped out walking around. And I don't have anything ready. And the deer pretty much walks 10 yards away. And I'm like, hmm. Yeah, the deer had no idea I was there. It was like a little escape route. You know, and I was like, oh, what are you up to that one? Because... That would never happen to anybody but me. Right. But like that, that prime instance, stick around like in, in public land, deer are used to pressure. That's normal to them. People walking around, bird hunters, stuff hunters, those deer grow up in that. So having somebody walk around the woods, that, that deer's not going to run the next county. He's going to go, loop around around and go about his merry way. So the best way to handle those things is, you know, just stick it out. You know, uh, deer are used to it. And, you know, if you can, use it to your advantage. If not, it's like, oh, this place is blown out. These people are all going here, so I'll go over here. You know, and that's the best advice I can give somebody when it comes to public. You know, like, because these deer, they they live in the fire. So they're used to that. You know, they just know how to, they've adapted to it, you know, because that's all they've ever known. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, I always have this feeling in my head, it's like, like you just said, they, they live in the fire and they know, for the most part, where people are coming from. Like, yeah. And I, I always have this thought in the back of my mind. It's like, if I'm a deer and I hear somebody coming from this direction, how do I get away from that? What's, what's my escape route? If they come from a different direction, what's my escape route? It's like, for me, like the the access is not as important Like for me like as the human. I, I try to think about the way the deer's going to think about getting out and then go in from that direction and let everybody else push them to me. Yeah. And I mean, I've seen it. I was having some, uh, 
messages on Instagram last week and even this week about it. Um, how these bucks were just very smart. Like, uh, they don't move, like, even outside of the rut, they don't move to a must in daylight. But if they do, it's, you know, hunt, it's 50, 60 yards. You know, and a lot of guys that hunt public, they don't hunt, they hunt the foods or they don't, they hunt funnels, like low traffic areas. Um, but a good funnel is when deer comes through, but the odds of deer coming through is you know, not very high. So, public, you know, it, it, bed hunting is, you know, aggressive bed hunting has really been, you know, my saving grace as far as shooting, you know, seeing slash shooting mature deer, like getting as close to the bed as possible. And most people in public, they're just, you know, poking and hoping, you know, because here in Jersey, baiting's legal and I would say 50, 50% of the people bait. So these dudes are walking the same route, coming in the same time, you know, doing the same exact thing. And the deer are like, all right, like clockwork. Oh, here comes, here comes Freddy, you know, 20 minutes for light. And right. those older deer are like, uh, I'm good. And they just learn to, you know, either hunt the hunters, basically. The deer be betting near where hunters might be coming in. No hunters come in. He knows he's got this list to himself. They'll go about his merry way, you know. So that's why, um, you know, having, like, different access than most people can pay off and different exit than most people can pay off. Yeah. You almost have to have that mentality of when you go in there that it's, you know, you never know what might happen. You know, you could mm-hmm. have three different guys walk by you in an afternoon. It's like, well, you never know. They, one of those guys might have bumped a deer that's going to circle around and come back by me. I mean, that's the mentality I feel like, you know, that I get from a lot of you guys that, you know, are public land hunters that, that I talk to. And it's kind of it's kind of hard to start thinking that way as well, because you always want to, yeah. you know, us as humans, it's 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 natural to be, you know, think first, like negatively first. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then it's you just got to put a positive spin on it, I guess. Yeah. If you can understand, like I tell people, uh, I think our John Eberhardt, you know, first time I've. I've heard it in that context, but the, the predator prey relationship, like once you truly understand that, like we're, we're predators, they're prey, like they're, they're constantly evolving, changing their game, you know, modifying their behavior where you know, a, a true predator is doing the same thing. They're never, you know, doing the same. They're never walk like a wolf's never going to walk the same trail, head in the same direction. You know, right. or a coyote because they're going to start at that. If you, if you can put yourself in that mindset every time you go in there, or I need to learn, I need to make this happen because, you know, right. I'm starving or I need to eat. It's amazing how you can eventually there's, you know, you, that little switch will happen. Then you're like, and you almost see the woods yeah. in a different light. Like, it's like almost like matrix light. You can just look at it, a bunch of numbers, and they're like, all oh, make sense. And you're like, ah, oh, now yeah. I get it. Yeah, now I get it. You know? Yeah, it's. I've mentioned to Aaron in the past on on previous podcasts here, but you know, I I've always said it's for me. Nine times out of ten, I got to do something wrong before I do it right. Like I seldom yep. do things right the very first time. And the thing is, like when you do it wrong, you know you're not going to do that again. So it's it's a process of elimination. But when you make the decision to do it that way, you don't know it's going to be wrong. You think it's going to be right. Like I'm going to try this, see what happens, or you know yep. what I mean. And then it doesn't pan out, and you're like, well, shit, like, why didn't it work? How am I going to tweak this, you know? And then, you know, it might take two or three of those times, and then you're going to be successful. And like like you said, that predator thing, you're you're adapting, you're evolving to the circumstances, the conditions, the situation, the, the response, you know, that the animals, that the prey has based on other things like pressure and weather and just all that stuff. Like, it's just, it's a it's a constant game of, Cat and mouse, and speaking of like evolving, like this year, I, I ground hunt for years. I mean, fifteen years ago, sixteen years ago, I had my best season ever, like three bucks off from the ground, like all mature deer, uh, nothing like mega giant, but all mature for that area. And I, I shot them all from the ground, and wow. because hunting from the ground allowed me to make adjustments, like as the as the moment was unfolding, like all right. There's no, I got no opportunity here. I can like sneak down this dirt ditch and just set up here and shoot the deer. So this last year I started getting into it again, and this year I really, on windy days, actually after I shot my buck, 
I was on the ground still hunting. You know, rainy, I was on the ground still hunting, like heavy rain, the ground still hunting. I wasn't wasting my time sitting in a tree because, like, anybody hunting long enough, those conditions, the deer, they just don't move very much. Like, even during the rut. You know, so if they're not coming to me, I'm going to go to them. And I found some really good areas this year doing that. You know, almost got a couple shots off, (laughs) which is pretty uh, insane when you think about it. Yeah, and that uh, that's another thing I've got a question for. You know, I I watch Whitetail Adrenaline, and I'm sure you guys probably do too, you know, yeah. the DVDs with Jared and those guys. You know, and I'm interested to know, like, when you're walking through a piece like that and still hunting, like, how how do you approach that? Like, when you're going in, are you only walking, you know, 20, 30 yards, stopping for about a good five minutes, glassing? Like, what's your approach to that? Me, I just, I just move slow, and... I have the binoculars like on the chest and, you know, and, and the range finder, but I find that when it gets real thick brush, I'll use that. But I pretty much, I still hunt the areas where I know deer are going to be bedded or close by. Either I can cut a track or something. If I cut like a fresh track, you know, or like see some movement and then I'll really slow it down and, and kind of tackle it. But basically I try not to overthink it because <laughs> I have a tendency of like running a million different scenarios that I probably shouldn't be running in my head. And then it just messes me up and I'll go here, I go here and I try and just rely on that instinct, you know, that, that, that predator yeah. instinct, I guess, if you will. That gut your gut re- and it's usually your gut instinct. Yeah. It's, it's your first thought, you know, before you start talking yourself out of it. Yeah. And that seems to, for me, that seems to be, I trust myself. I trust my, my skill set. And I think that just comes with age too. Like the, you know, those white tail drone guys, they've been doing it so long. Like they just kind of know what to do because they allow themselves to, they, they trust themselves to trust the situation and trust the process. Is it always going to work out? No. But like we were saying earlier, you, you're going to learn something. If it, if it doesn't work, you're going to learn something out of the deal. And sometimes that, what you learn is actually better, you know, in the long run than, you know, shooting a deer because you, you know, you learn something about yourself or something you can apply somewhere later. Yeah. You, the, the success in that hunt is, you know, banking that experience and knowing what to do better next time. Exactly. And that's, and I think a lot of people have, especially now with like the trail cameras and all the other, the joys that are out there to make hunting, you know, easier. If you strip hunting down and you look at deer, you know, from a standpoint, they want food, bedding you know food you know and then the ladies pretty much in that order (laughs) yeah Uh, you know and if you simplify it you know and don't put these 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 big old bucks on this pedestal because once you put something on a pedestal almost like it's unkillable or it's unattainable then you pretty much already psyched yourself out no you know you've already psyched yourself out of a situation 100 percent. i i'm glad you said that because that is that is so true because your old habits, like your self-image and all, your your habits, your bad habits you've built over years, like they will win that game every, every time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> and I I think like I think a lot of guys like that or and gals. I don't want to say guys, but um, people that do that, you know, I think sometimes in the instance when they have the opportunity to kill that animal, like there's got to be like a gut check moment there. It's like if I do this, it's over. I got nothing else. Yeah. You know, like I I gotta wonder like does that thought cross their mind? Like for me, I know it would, but I'm I'm not one of those people who like idolizes an individual. You know, like I want, I just want to have success in knowing that I won the fight that day. You know, and whether that comes with a with a kill or an encounter or something like it's it doesn't matter to me. Like, but I mean, I'm like you, like. I've defaulted to public land this year. You know, I, I did hunt private back in New York, and but this is the first year I've really kind of committed to it and just taken it for what it is. So I mean, there, there's no way you can like idolize a single individual like that when you when you hunt like this. No, and it's you know, and I've I've been blessed. You know, fortunately, like my dad, my dad's a really good woodsman, and. He's never, you know, he's killed a lot of deer, but he, my dad's a killer. Like he's not a mature killer. If we were ever starving, 
I'd want my dad with me because he just kill. He just knows how to understand deer movement in a in a way that you know. I grew up having that guy as a as a uh, mentor, role model. So I was a killer for a long time, and to, to make that switch from a killer to like a mature deer killer was a hard, long switch to make because, like you saying, like oh, your self image, old habits died hard, and I psych myself out on a lot of deer. Talk myself out of shot. I can't make that shot. I, you know, he's too far of that twig or that branch. And now, you know, I don't ever second guess where my shot's going to be. Like I don't second guess like my movements or like to that gut feeling. I just go with it, you know. Yeah. yeah. And that's just something that comes with time. And some people probably have a better uh, handle on it at, a, at an earlier age, you know, than than my myself, I guess. My person. Yeah, and, you know, I, I think, I mean, I agree with you 100%. And one thing I would add to that is it goes back to that predator-prey thing. You know, no matter how you break it down, you're always the predator. So, like, do you have that instinct or don't you? Like, it's, I mean, it's a fact. Not every predator is the one. Like, you could have two coyotes, like a male and a female pair. You know, they're not both hunting, you know, equally successful, you know, successfully equal or you know what i'm trying to say yeah you know it's like it's like lions you know the females hunt the males the males don't hunt for the most part only females do so it's yeah. like you know there's there's a natural instinct that all predators have like you know you've got it or you don't yeah and that's i mean and, uh, i think that's the, the the beauty of, of like hunting and like fishing is you don't necessarily have to be genetically gifted, like physical specimen on, on any friends. Like you just got to be smarter, and you know it's not really hard work. It's like it's smart work. Like when I scout and people tell me all the time, like oh, it looks like hard work, it's a lot of work. It's not really work, you know. I'm enjoying what I'm doing, but I do it in a, a very smart. You know, now like I got kids and stuff. Like my scouting and hunting, I have to be smart with my time. You know, like for me, I'm an October killer, so I don't necessarily take vacations in October because I know I'm going to kill a deer on the weekends in October. Like that's my mindset where I save all my, you know, three weeks vacation for November, you know, waiting for that magical switch to happen when I start killing deer in November. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) You know, you you have to play to your strengths, you know, and you have to work with what you have. Don't concentrate too much on your weaknesses. You know, for me, like I'm, I don't shore up my weaknesses more than I, you know, try to amplify my strengths. You know, yeah. like my, like my scouting is on point. You know, I can scout a piece of woods on, on any type of terrain fast, get an idea how it is. And usually it takes three years for, you know, things to pan out. And I, I think a lot of people want it too fast. Yeah. Um, it takes time, especially public, because, I mean, this year, I had a lot of encounters with bucks, few encounters with people. But when you hunt a, you know, a thousand acre piece, half of it's marsh, half of it's woods, I don't know who's in there during the week. And I come hunt it Saturday. I could be in the best spot in the world. But when you hunt public, you got to have like that 10%. Like I used to think like, I'm not lucky, I'm skilled. There's, you got to have a little bit of luck on your side. <laughs> you know, like, right. you, know, you have to have the perfect. Everything has to line up. The stars have to line, and nobody has to be in that that piece of woods for a day or two, or no coyotes, you know, or no, you know, that deer's crossing the road and somebody stopped and trying to light on it, and a deer ran further than he normally would have. Like all these things have to yeah. line up. So <laughs> there's a definite bit of luck in in public. You know, I used to think it was all skill, but you you got to have that ten percent. It's probably like ninety ten or even eighty five fifty. Yeah. I agree. You know, Greg, when you're scouting this time of year, you know, we're in February now, end of February, going into March. What are you scouting for on public land? Um, for me, it's I look for uh, new bedding opportunities, or if I had some close encounters, I look at how I can tweak those areas. Um, as I said, I've gotten older and less time to spend in the woods, you know. I... I try and not scout too much or I used to like to scout 
Saturday and Sunday, so, you know, eight, ten hours a day, all over the place. And I had stands and trees, you know, ideas for days, and I would hunt maybe a third of them, not even. Right. So now I'm a little more selective, like, all right, um, this piece I'm really diving into this would be my second year scouting, you know, two and a half year scouting. I, I hunted it late season a few years ago. So I'm really starting to try and dial in certain spots now. It's like I'm getting in that two to three year mark where I'm expecting, you know, good things to happen. Cause I understand people, you know, um, the, cause it's salt marsh, like the tides, you know, how long it takes me to get there and how long some of these spots, cause I'm out, you know, I got a, a mile walk out in the marsh so I don't blow up these deer on these little islands. And when you're walking there in the pitch black, you know, or you know, walking out in pitch black, it's a, it sucks. It, but yeah, there's a lot of hiccups. People are like, oh, that ditch is really deep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I need to find a different way around because I will sink and die if I fall into that. Right. <laughs> uh, so this this year's it's this time of year it's beds. Um, and so I've been really trying to focus on my rut um, set up, especially water access. These last couple of years, getting back into canoe hunting. Um, so doe bedding areas, um, trying to find some persimmon trees that are near some doe bedding areas for that late October, you know, Halloween. I call it the Halloween rush when, you know, you get some bucks on their feet moving. Um, and I find around here in New Jersey, up until about November 2nd, it some people in the woods, but it's slowly starting here in New Jersey, starting to ramp up. So I got pretty good section of woods to myself until about you know, October, November 4th. And then it's like all hands on deck. Every, every jabroni's out in the woods. <laughs> hunting, it seems. <laughs> yep. And that's why I think it is around here too. You know, in Michigan with the public land, the guys, the locals and people that I talk to that hunt the public is the bow hunting pressure. There's not a ton of it in a lot of these pieces, but once November 15th hits, you know, which is, opening day of gun season it's you might as well not even go on it you know and it's just yeah. a lot of people out there and and my my kind of thing is you know i want to hunt it during the week you know get off work or a little early head over or you know take a day off of work if i can and uh go hunt it during the week because I'm, I'm gonna guess a lot of guys probably don't hunt you know on public or hunt you know get a chance to hunt at all during the week no you know, not until I said that November 4th for here. Yeah. Uh, that's a lot of people put their vacation in. And for me, I mean, October 20th has always been my day. It's, I've killed, seen and killed most of my big deer uh, on that date. You know, day before, that day or day after. Yep. And um, and that now with, you know, I run, I run cameras. I let them sit over scraping areas and, and rubs. And I don't mess with them, you know. For two or three years, I was just gaining intel on them, changing batteries or change out the camera. And I've been noticing uh, around here, you know, I probably shouldn't say this because people get on, get wise to the ways, but um, October 15th, I'm getting a lot of daylight activity of bucks starting these scrapes and starting these scraping areas. And I'm, I'm talking like certified whoppers. No, like uh, it's a big year and a half. I mean, big thick horn, you know, big neck deer, um, in daylight hours, October 13th to like the 16th, like starting these scraping areas. So I'm like, uh huh. I know where I'll be. Cause I used to hunt, start hunting scrapes like the 20th. So I'm like, Oh, all right. You know, and I'm getting this pattern on a couple sections that here in Jersey. So I'm like, Hmm, all right. I know where I'll be, you know? Till next year, October fifteenth. <laughs> yeah, you know, setting setting scrapes because I never would have thought you know setting scrapes. Yep. Um, but and maybe it's because I'm you know, I'm docking the scrapes up, you know, or they're trying to be the first one to the game with a those getting the heat. I, I don't really know why, but these last two years, mm. a lot of daylight activity that time, so I'm gonna give that a crack. Yeah, and that's, you know, the way I'm scouting right now, too, and what I'm doing and what I'm going to do this weekend is, you know, I'm just trying to get 
used to the area as well. I've never set foot on it, you know, but one time for about an hour. So I'm getting used to the area, but I, I, I put some pins on a map too, and I want to go look at those and for possible stand locations and also find out where all the, all the activity is in the snow. You know what I mean? See where yeah. all the, the movement is just to kind of hone in on some, uh, some deer, you know, some deer sign just, uh, maybe start from, you know, that's, that's basically what I'm trying to do. Is, uh, is it like hill, rolling hill country or flat farm? No, it's flat and a pancake. And there's, uh, yeah. you know, the there's a marsh that runs through. Basically, it would be the west side of it, the west central side of it. Um, mm-hmm. And there's some islands out in it. And went out to one of the islands that I had, I had previously on a map before I even set foot on it. Went out there and I put a pin on it. Walked out there and kicked up 12 bedded does right, right where I put my pin. So I'm like, well, yeah. I'm I'm in a, I'm in a good, <laughs> I'm in a good. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a good start a good anyway. Time. Yeah, and that's um, they said there's marsh areas or, or havens for for does and and bucks, but they're marsh. They're speaking of marsh, they've got to be the most frustrating spot to hunt. Yeah, yeah I've seen them, like, some just absolute big deer, and like they're coming, and like, oh my god, they get ready, and like they go through like this little brushy you know section of marsh they never come out you're like where did you go where why exactly <laughs> yeah. no you just don't disappear yeah and it's like a, you know i had that spot uh this year I had a giant eight pointer come through and it was so windy i'm like i didn't dress at all for the day i didn't check the weather I'm like oh northwest wind i didn't i didn't see the 40 mile an hour burst of wind so i'm sitting in this tree you know like one stick high I mean, I literally had to face away from the wind. Like, my, I was just, like, cold. Like, I felt my soul, like, leaving my body. I was so cold. <laughs> and I just happened to look back for a second, and it's just a big slammer eight, like, 10 yards, just walking, like, fast-paced walking into the bedding area. And by the time I seen him, I couldn't even get my belt. I just was, like, I don't even care at that point. I was so cold. I remember just turning around, like, just, like, trying to look at him from a corner of my eye. I'm like, I care, but I don't care because I'm freezing to death. Right, like I'm, <laughs> right. You know, and the next day I had this buck come in and just he just stayed just in the thick brush. You know, uh, I can shoot in some of this marsh little spots that are real thin, but he stayed just in the thick stuff, parallel in these two does, and he was following these two does by sound. But the wind's in my face, I can't smell them. They move, he would move. And I can see, like, glimpses of the bone. It looked like a pretty good deer. I got a really good, good view of him, but I'm like, man, how are you supposed to kill a deer that does that? You right. know, like, <laughs> this is like, I'm right there. He's 20 yards away, 25 yards away. And all I see is just a little bit of bone every now and again. And the does have moved these little section of reeds, but he's just parallel. I'm like, you know, 20 yards off. I'm like, that's just so frustrating because, you know, I'm, I won, you know, I won that game, you know, in that, that, you know, cat and mouse game, but no shots. You know, you can see him and it's like, ah, oh, I hate the marsh. I love it, but I hate it. Yep. <laughs> Seeing them and killing them is two different things, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, cool. I, you know, I want to kind of wrap this up here. We're, we're right at an hour and, uh, I want to thank you for coming on again, man. It's always a pleasure to yeah, have man. you on and, and, uh, we'll have to do it again for sure after you kill a, kill another one this yeah. next year. <laughs> I'm, uh, I said, uh, I'm really focusing on, I actually got a little whiteboard and I got my little goal statements. Um, another thing for your listeners, if you're going to be a consistent killer, you have to keep notes. Um, I used to be a really good note taker. I had stands and, and directions and travel routes and I stopped. I got away from it by being you know, lazy or arrogant or whatever. But this year I'm back on it and the goal, number one goal is to find doe bedding areas because with having a, a newborn time is limited so i need to make these november hunts count if you could see me i'm raising my hand because i'm right there with you <laughs> yeah <laughs> yep. yeah back to you know sneaking in and out of these dope dope bedding areas but, uh, and plus i just want to say i killed one during the, i want to kill when deer are dumb and stupid not when they're you know super smart and cautious i want to shoot a dumb deer for once right yep and you did this year. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, cool, man. Thanks for coming on and taking the time and doing this. And uh, we both, Justin and I, appreciate it, man. 
Yeah, man. It's uh, always a pleasure. All right, man. Well, you got you have a good evening. All right, man.